Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Let us begin with all of this. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you the President of the Spanish Chamber of Commerce, Jose Maria Segurola, who's also the CEO of Caixa Bank in South Africa, to officially welcome you all. Jose Maria, please. Yeah, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, the welcome to the European uh, Chamber webinar uh, on Wednesday. So uh, what I think is that today we will be able to, to learn a little bit more about the free trade in Africa. And uh, so a, a, a special word of welcome to our guest uh, and speaker, Mr. Pravin Maharaj. Uh, he is the president of EasyDex Industrial Procurement Services and founder of TradeBricks. Uh, I think that uh, if someone can add value uh, to this, uh, you know, trade uh, situation and uh, the the outlook of the situation uh, for, for the next uh, months in, in Africa is Mr. Mr. Pravin Maharaj. Uh, also, a warm uh, welcome to our fellow chambers, uh, Belgian, Italian, French, Swiss, Swiss Chamber, uh, the Secretary General and General Managers, and uh, the members are joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jose Maria. Some house rules, ladies and gentlemen, before we begin. Uh, if you can all just please, and by now I know that you do know this, is keep your microphones off during the presentation and your cameras. What you can do, and Pravin has asked that we make this as interactive as possible, is during the presentation, either post a question on the chat or raise your hand, and then you can um, unmute yourself, put on your uh, video, and then you can interact directly with Pravin. What is important, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that we are really living in chaotic times right now. So as much as there's chaos, there's a lot of order that is sort of putting itself together in this new um, norm, if we can call it that. I had a, a really um, wonderful conversation with Pravin at the beginning of the year. And this is when I officially met him. And he was telling me what he's been doing with Trade Bricks and how involved he's become with regards to empowering all his clients um, about looking at new markets. And going into Africa is definitely an opportunity for all of our members. What makes it even better for all of us is that it is an Africa continental free trade deal going on. And it talks to the different areas. Pravin, without further ado, because they're not here to listen to me this morning, they're here to listen to you. Uh, I would officially like to hand over to you and just to let our, um, our visitors on this webinar know is that you've been an academic and you are an academic. And this is something that you now share um, you're very passionate about growing businesses and within the normal corporate governance rules, which makes it so much more powerful. Um, and you've all received um, Pravin's CV, so I'm not going to speak much more about him. But as you interact with Pravin this morning, you will get to know him. He's extremely humble um, as an academic. And it's really good to have you on board. Pravin, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manala, and of course to our president of the Spanish uh, Chamber and uh, to the Spanish Chamber itself. Um, it's a pleasure and privilege to be uh, uh, invited to uh, just begin to have a chat around something which uh, I perceive to be uh, uh, an exciting new era for Africa. So uh, for me, it's going to be an interesting session, sharing some of my thoughts but I must confess that um, I am no uh, expert in the unfolding free trade uh, agreement uh, because it's still an incomplete uh, agenda. It's about to be ratified. Phase two is about to be ratified. And I think we are the embryonic stage of something which is going to be beneficial um, to Europe as well as Africa. So for me, that excites me. Um, of course, we're living in, as you mentioned, Manola, we are living in a period of unprecedented challenges. Now, COVID has, we all know COVID, we know what the, um, the, the challenges are around the world, and we talk about that on a daily basis. We have yet to um, identify a, uh, a vaccine for it, but our reality is that whilst we are 
in this midst of this challenge, uh, we have to also talk about the Renaissance. I'm also uh, quite uh, pleased to see that in previous pandemic, uh, humanity has come back and bounced back uh, very well. And if you look at the Renaissance period in Europe, uh, one would uh, be forgiven if you suddenly look at, uh, you think it was all just progress uh, because we lost quite a large percentage of our population there. So I think we are in a similar period in our history. And um, for me, it's not about the pandemic anymore. It's about the Renaissance period, the new Renaissance. And whilst Western countries do have budgets to fight COVID through the billions of dollars, Africa does not have that luxury. But we have a closet of 54 separated vaults, 54 vaults separated, haven't worked in unison before. And when they come together, it represents a 3.5 or $3.4 trillion opportunity. Now for me, I think that's something that has excites it also humbles. We become pragmatic as well about the reality of Africa. Is it real? Are we talking about a continent which is uh, um, flushed with challenges like the famous 20th century characterization of Africa? Or are we now in a dynamic new century with a dynamic new beginning? And I think uh, if we unpack as we go into this session, uh, to literally look at Africa, what she has to offer, what has a free trade agreement. So I've got an agenda and uh, please, you may wish to uh, stop me whenever you want to, just to have a conversation around it, or we could also do it at the end. So briefly, I'm looking at, looking at rebuilding advantaged economy. I use the word deliberately advantaged economy. We want to become an advanced economy by 2063. But Africa has been disadvantaged for such a long period in its history. So I deliberately chose the word advantaged because I think it's Africa's time right now. She's getting an act together. For anyone who had doubted that um, there will be ideologies that will prevent the coming together of Africa. I think that has been put to bed with the creation of the free trade agreement. And that free trade agreement has confounded critics. We're now looking at pragmatism, which prevails the coming together for a common goal and common agenda. So we'll talk about that. We'll look briefly at the uh, free uh, trade agreement and how Europe is going to play, not can, but will play a very significant role in this Renaissance. And I think when we look at uh, Europe and Africa, we are literally neighbors. And how do we unlock the opportunities there? Uh, let's look at realizing a previously uh, blue ocean market. How can we create a blue ocean market uh, from 54 disparate countries who have been doing literally their own thing for decades and then collaborating in areas just uh, where it mattered and literally didn't do much trade. So we we'll look at that and uh, uh, see how we could unpack uh, the opportunity of blue, uh, the blue ocean strategy, unpacking opportunities for Europe, for, or for businesses in Africa. And then the third one, of course, is to look at the untapped potential when the coming together happens and there is that free movement of goods, products, brands, and services. How do we sustain that initiative? Uh, and then, of course, create new business trajectories within the existing corporate rules-based culture that exists currently uh, in various parts of the world. So we'll go on to the next slide. Thank you. So here we are, this uh, agreement is regarded as one of the most important of the 21st century. 
And uh, of course, it cannot be underestimated. Um, the World Trade Organization predicts that it will generate hundreds of billions of dollars for Africa. So it is a very significant moment in the history of Africa. The next slide, please. So currently, um, these are some of the agreements that are being uh, signed uh, between the 54 coming, uh, countries coming together. There's uh, customs, cooperation, mutual administrative assistance, trade facilitation, um, transit facilitation, technical barriers, literally the entire ecosystem for trade and investments. So if there's any doubt anywhere in Europe about the seriousness of investments and trade for Africa and uh, doubt that uh, investments uh, will be uh, under threat, then understand that these agreements that are coming into play together with uh, the EPA um, uh, coming into alignment with the free trade agreement and I think that's very significant for uh, trade and investments, businesses um, across Europe, across Africa. I think the phase two agreements will cover the uh, protocols for competition, uh, protocols for intellectual property rights, how do we protect that, the protocols for investment. Um, so that was, uh, will sufficiently uh, identify guarantees uh, for uh, cross-border trade. Now, we know that uh, trade between European uh, Union countries exceeds 60%. It's a similar statistics with other trading blocks in the world, but within Africa, intra-Africa trade represents uh, around 15, 16, 18%. So herein lies a phenomenal opportunity for us to look at the free trade agreement as the beginning of unlocking uh, this $3.4 trillion opportunity. Next slide, please. So here we are, 1.2 billion. Just to put that in a nutshell, we've got the AU, African Union on one hand, we've got the European Union on the other. We have 500 million consumers uh, representing $18.3 trillion GDP. It's the largest rules-based single market in the world. And we have a 1.2 billion consumer market in Africa. Of course, they are quite differentiated, vast, varied. And, uh, but I can tell you with conviction that we have a middle-class consuming, emerging consuming power of 170 million. Now that's a very sizable and significant consuming market. And before COVID, we were like seven out of 10 fastest growing economies in the world. And having, having spoken this morning to a colleague in Canada, and uh, they thought Africa was just one huge country. Uh, and they were surprised to understand that there's 54 countries representing 54 economies of different size coming together to unlock this opportunity. So here we are 1.2 billion people uh, in our midst. Uh, the agreements offer, uh, free trade agreements offer opportunities, um, origin of products, manufacturing, infrastructure. I think these are all the huge macro initiatives that are required and we'll unpack it as we go. Um, the EPA, uh, very interestingly, and, and we'll unpack it as we go further down, the uh, strategic investments in job creation has made major commitments in, in investments in education, matching skills and jobs, business environment. So you can begin to see there's a harmonizing of initiatives, both on the part of Europe on one hand, and the coming together of the African countries on the other hand. So as neighbors, if we begin to join forces, and then you've got a 1.8 billion consumer market that's made up of luxury goods from the top right up until uh, value creative, 
products, brands, and services on the lower end. Next slide, please. So, so we'll skip quite fast with these ones. Rebuilding an advantaged economy. How do we unpack um, that prompts avoiding the pitfalls? So South Africa, Africa could uh, find itself both uh, in a place where we have these extreme challenges on one hand, and on, on the other hand, we sit on a kind of leveled playing field to invent a new way of uh, investing in infrastructure. Because so many of the segments in Africa are yet to be developed from ground up. And with emerging technology, uh, uh, telecommunication and uh, new ways of communicating like the way we are doing right now, um, I think it's quite significant to state that we could grow faster in Africa than perhaps in any other period of development in any country's history. Because we have the requisite tools, technology, and human resources at our doorstep. Uh, to actually initiate that. The next slide, please. Great, so one of the big areas for investment would be in renewable energy. Whilst we speak about the opportunities on one hand in Africa, we become humbled by the challenges that Africa faces. Energy is one of them, power, electricity. Uh, about 600 million people in Africa have yet to receive electricity. And so that has a cascading effect on virtually every other area of their lives. So health is affected, investment is affected, trade is uh, affected. So one of the biggest enablers would be uh, would be in renewable energy, looking at ways of how we could use renewable energy, which has enormous potential and underlying, underutilized investments in solar, wind, biomass, hydro, natural gases. Uh, just recently, Total had signed up to uh, extract uh, um, uh, You've got natural gases in Mozambique valued at $20 billion. Now we need to shift from exploration of those gases to literally creating an entire value chain. A value chain that will ensure that um, it reaches Southern Africa. South Africa could become a big user of clean uh, technologies, uh, clean energy in the future uh, with, the, with its uh, sub-Saharan countries benefiting substantially from these initiatives. And I think that's a big emerging sector uh, for Africa. How do you unlock the opportunity? How do you bring in all stakeholders? So whilst there is renewable energy and we develop the value chain, how do we contribute through the EU and the AU countries, how do we, through the partnership that exists, how do we unpack that? Are there best practices in Europe that uh, Africa could utilize? How do we bring that? How do we package it? How do we promote it? How do we bring it to the people? At the end of the day, are we developing for the purpose of bringing prosperity, progress, security, peace, development to people, to 1.2 billion people. How can we also enhance the opportunities for 600 million Europeans in the EU? So here's an initiative by the uh, European Commission, um, by, the, by the EU, the 44 billion euros 
that are being spent in the renewable, renewable energy. And look at the compounding effect of that, that, that initiative. What does it unlock? What kind of opportunities would emerge? How could we create blue, blue ocean solutions out of this mass Red Sea markets that we are all surrounded by? And for me, those are the areas, those are the talking points. That what, that's what we should be beginning to talk about in the unfolding months. That represents the renaissance for all of us uh, coming together to unlock these opportunities. The next slide, please. All right, uh, manufacturing. Manufacturing, manufacturing what? Textile, retail, now bringing to the people these opportunities. How do we now take the macro initiatives uh, that are being rolled out, bringing them down into sizable industries? Are there new ways of manufacturing? Do, do we continue to stay with the old methodologies and the old world uh, solutions? How do we bring uh, realization to smarter ways of manufacturing? How could we create through technology a kind of uh, joint initiative between those who have the technology, the tools, the investments, the know-how, and tie that up with the fertile soil that's available in Africa. There's a fertile consuming market in Africa. If you look at uh, the manufacturing floor right now, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, in China. But if you look at the global trade tensions that is unfolding, that will impact on Africa, that will impact on Asia. We're seeing a kind of uh, realignment of Asia right now from the Asia Pacific to the Indo-Pacific. We're seeing the quad emerging between um, Australia, um, Japan, US and India. We're looking at um, um, new alliances, new supply chains. So can Africa, through its partnership with the EU, get involved with joint projects in the textile sector, in the electronic sector, in the retail sector? So suddenly the knowledge that exists in the e within the EU countries could come further down into Africa in what the EU now calls a partnership model with Africa on based on equals. So we want to see that partnership maturing and we'll talk about that as we go on. So here we have machinery, equipment. We, we know that there's sizable investments. For example, uh, South Africa is the largest auto manufacturing country on the continent, but we do know components come from Europe. Um, then the cars are manufactured in South Africa and then sold off uh, about 300,000 uh, units, uh, 350,000 units are sold across Europe. So can, that's an amazing statistic. How do we enhance that? With the free trade agreement, when the uh, 1.2 billion uh, people come together forming a common movement of brands, products and services, how can we double, treble, quadruple this opportunity? And I think, these are the areas, these are the top points. This is what has to filter down through the various chambers in Europe uh, to uh, businesses across Europe. The message is very clear. Africa is open for development. The message is very clear that it's a safe investment destination. The message is very clear that the world's manufacturing floors are shifting. China itself is no more manufacturing uh, apparels, for example, is moving apparels to Ethi Ethiopia. So why would China move manufacturing to Ethiopia? Because the costs are better. It's uh, closer to markets. It's uh, um, raw materials are available. So can we begin to understand the changing dynamics of the manufacturing sector? And how can the EU, through its partnership with African countries, come together unpack that through the chamber to chamber in Africa and the EU, uh, ensure that there's benefits there. Ravin, sorry, yes. can I interrupt here right Go ahead, now? Fanola. Because yeah. a question has just come through 
And you've yep. just said Africa is open to Europe. Um, so one of the questions is currently in South Africa, we have to, uh, for direct foreign investors, they have to manage uh, the black, uh, broad-based black economic empowerment um, legislation. Is this something equal in Africa that these uh, foreign investors would have to adhere to? I, I think the, the entire continent is quite dynamic. I think negotiations are on across the continent. Uh, whether it's the free trade Africa that promotes intra-Africa trade, or it's the European Union negotiating trade uh, opportunities with the countries in Africa. I think we, we must accept that there's a shift also uh, in thinking within the EU uh, leadership. We're now talking about Africa in a partnership model as opposed to uh, just uh, buying its raw material and commodities. So I think this coming together, I think the message to investors in uh, across Europe is that Africa is a safe investment destination if the benefits are mutual. I think that's, that's the moot uh, point right now. And, and, and we know South Africa, for example, is one of the most equal uh, economic countries in the world. There's extreme uh, uh, extremities on both sides. We've got extreme poverty on one end and we've got extreme opulence and success on the other hand. And how do you find a happy medium for investments? And I think through the trade negotiations um, between the various countries, I think issues could be addressed. But if we begin to address it holistically and look at the bigger picture, South Africa is not here for the short term. Africa is not here for the long term, for the Africa for the short term. It's a medium to long term investment in partnerships, development and transformation. I think, you know, around that, there should be a lot of talking points. Um, I, I think often we get, uh, we look at laws uh, at, at, at the face value, it can be daunting. But I think when you begin to unpack it and if you look at the benefits, and if we're true to the partnership model that uh, the EU is promoting right now, then there should be benefits to both Africa, South Africa, and Europe. And I think that is certainly, there's room for that negotiation. And I think that's where, I'm, I'm not the spokesman for uh, South African government or any African government, but my understanding as a business investor in South Africa, going into Africa, I would want to look at uh, Africa from a lens where development has a value chain that benefits all stakeholders as opposed to just the shareholders. And I think we need to begin to see Africa in that uh, paradigm as a stakeholder model. I think uh, for us in, uh, across Europe, uh, we need to look at new ways and verticals to do business that will bring value, greater value. As long as Europe is benefiting and enhancing its value quotient through the partnerships in Africa, I think there's goodwill there for all stakeholders. And I think I mean, more thank you. Yeah. No worries. Uh, just, uh, just to support what you've been saying, um, Ernst um, Kunferman, who is from the Swiss Chamber, has put a yes. note here for everyone. I don't know if you've read it, that for LNG in Mozambique expertise, especially in skills development contact, uh, yes. you've got to contact FLEK Swiss Consulting, and it's their goal to dual vet educate half a million people. Um, and uh, this is what the Swiss are doing. And I've also seen that Clive has just put another point where he says, are there different approaches to public and private sectors in the different African countries? Um, which is a very important question, by the way. And then I've got another one as well that said that, um, you know, corruption is, is a brand known in Africa. Doing business in Africa sort of lends to corruption. So how do investors mitigate this risk? Yeah. So uh, if, if there's anyone who would like to answer some of the questions within the panel, that'll be great. But um, 
I, I think uh, Africa, for me, the way I perceive it, has adopted uh, pragmatism as on its agenda. I think uh, at one time we had ideologies driving uh, uh, various agendas across the world. But today um, it's about uh, coming together of like-minded forces who sees the common goal and vision of human prosperity, both on the continent of Africa as well as uh, the, across the EU. Uh, so if, if you look at it from that paradigm, then I think there's room for negotiations. Um, what's happening across the private sector, you're going to find that Africa is quite a differentiated model. We've always banded the term Africa as if it's one homogenic one force, but we have such wide and varied understanding and operations across the continent. But the, the fact that the coming together of 54 countries to put a common development, trade and investment through development, development through trade and investment agenda on the table, and then opening up the various uh, areas for negotiation. Uh, I think that is a, a new beginning. That is a coming together. So you now got one unified force. Yes, there's going to be an increase in intra-Africa trade. So there will be harmonized laws. Of course, there are laws that are going to uh, uh, ensure that uh, more vulnerable, smaller countries are not dominated by uh, the larger, bigger countries. So there are checks and balances. So I think there's quite a unique agenda on the table to protect um, countries that are vulnerable, but at the same time to level the playing, the level the playing field for trade and investments. So it's, it's an amazing start with the free trade. And, and we must note that once when we have the free trade going and it's gonna be intra-Africa trade, the quality of, uh, or the transformation of the consumer from just consuming goods to becoming a more sophisticated consumer, then also uh, will be to the benefit of uh, uh, countries across the EU who have uh, branded products. And, they, and, and it's commonly, if, you, if those of us who have read the uh, book on uh, the uh, fortune at the bottom uh, of the pyramid uh, by C.K. Prahlad, uh, one would find that um, the low income do like brands, they do like uh, quality, but also they like value in products. And, and for, for me, those are the uh, you know, touch points that uh, when it comes to uh, trading across Africa, uh, there are favorable uh, laws that are favoring, like for example, East Africa has got its act together very beautifully with Comisa coming together representing 500 million people and consuming as a consuming power. So they've been getting it right for the last two decades. Um, the free trade is a brand new document. It's unfolding and I think uh, it's going to be a larger, bigger opportunity. So I see more opportunities than challenges, but challenges, yes, there will be challenges, but the opportunities would be widespread. Yeah. Thank you, Praveen. Thank you for that. Great stuff. So can we just go to... And we carry on. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Oil and gas, we know that now uh, this, this oil and gas is uh, one of the huge sectors. Um, how do we value that? Where do we invest? I think there's huge opportunities for uh, investors in this sector. Uh, there's new discoveries all the time. Uh, South Africa has made discoveries in Mosal Bay. Total is uh, looking at uh, getting that off the ground. Uh, the Mozambique one is very good. Number five, next slide. These are just some of the areas which we think has major potential for, for big investors to come in. So that the uh, middle tier mining is, has always been uh, good for Africa. It's endowed with riches across the continent. How do we translate that into uh, a value chain? Uh, by the way, if, if you speak to many in Africa, uh, many would just acknowledge that they don't even understand that they own mines in Africa. So how do we bring value 
uh, from the minds to the people uh, through development. And I think these are new beginnings. These are new areas for uh, countries who invest um, in the mining sector. How do we develop that? Uh, number six. Great stuff. E-governance, it's, it's once again, um, I, th I think the EU is playing quite a significant role uh, in guiding uh, discussions around this sector. And with e-governance brings about better governance, uh, more open uh, systems that uh, the communities across the continent will, will actually benefit. So I think there's a lot of opportunities here uh, in terms of e-governance. Uh, seven. The next slide, we'll just go through these slides in a bit quick succession. Telecommunications, what surprises me is the interest from global advertising giants. If we just go back to seven, please. I'll twin uh, number seven with uh, uh, the digital strategy focus. Uh, the uh, ICT sector, uh, unearthing digital Africa has a lot of promise for investors um, knowing that the 5G rollout in some parts of Africa has already begun. Um, telecommunications is huge. Um, this is a sector that's going to uh, enhance the development of Africa. The next slide. Number eight, agro-processing. Agriculture is also huge opportunities uh, for capital goods, for investors. Um, there's huge opportunities opening up uh, for investors in this sector. How can the EU through its partnership agreement uh, promote this sector? Number nine. Great stuff. I think we'll spend a few minutes here because for me, the a second big uh, uh, area that, that quite excites me is the, the shift in, um, in the way Africa is viewed. And it's a new Africa-Europe Alliance for Sustainable Investments and Jobs. This status, I think, if it's unpacked by the various chamber, of commerces across the EU and brought to the attention of businesses. I think this sends a very strong and powerful message to both leaders in Africa, across the apex bodies, together with the EU countries, that the model that we're looking at is just not about investments, but investments that meaningly, meaningfully promote development trade and investments that promotes development is the agenda on the African, uh, on, on, on the African agenda. And how do we unpack that? How do we take this? How do we meaningfully unpack this partnership model? How do we bring this to a people to people, business to business kind of handshake? So whilst it's the vision of the EU to ensure that this partnership uh, is one of equal. It has to de be demonstrated on the ground. And I think for businesses across the European Union um, and businesses across Africa, this partnership model would need to be looked at, unpacked and presented as one of opportunity which will promote the renaissance that we speak about. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, that's coming together of the puzzle. It seems like Bradley was putting this together and piecing the 54 countries that represents that renaissance of 1.2 billion. So here we are, we've been apart for so long and there's a puzzle coming together and um, consolidating 
um, the, on one hand, through the free trade agreement, bringing 54 countries together, and on the other hand, through the partnership model from the EU, and then tying up the 600 million with the 1.2 billion, I think this is going to be quite an amazing journey in the unfolding years. So whilst we are in a period of extreme challenges right now, I think if we begin to unpack the roadmap for Africa together with the EU, then this puzzle coming together represents that renaissance. The next step, or is there any more slides? So this is some figures and statistics to say that the EU is already Africa's largest investor. Uh, the EU is the largest investor in Africa. I think more than 236, 40 billion euros annually in Africa. With the free trade agreement, with the free trade agreement, we will see that this, these figures actually become small when the unified Africa begins to function and thrive. Uh, because of course, in all areas, if, if the diversification happens as we perceive it, that the EU begins to expand uh, into all other areas, all other sectors in Africa, then we see the trade uh, investments both ways. Uh, shifting upwards quite significantly. So for me, that is also something that excites um, that we can unpack and connect uh, with uh, uh, the, connect the EU together with Africa, bringing together that uh, disconnect that may have existed in certain segments of um, industry, trade, etc. How do we provide a more holistic, diverse suite of services uh, to Africa. Next, the next slide, please. Okay. okay, so that just continues with the tapping into the full potential. You can go on to the next slide and I think we've covered all of that. Yeah, so the EPA is a very interesting uh, permanent document uh, promoting trade and investments across the continent um, in the Pacific, the Caribbean, as well as Africa. And uh, South Africa is one of the huge recipients of investments uh, from Europe. Uh, so would be um, East Africa. If you begin to look at the trade patterns, which uh, is there, how do we, through the partnership that we spoke about, the shifting understanding of that partnership, how does it become deeper how do we tap into the uh, free trade initiative? How could we bring value to it? How could we prepare the markets, not just for short-term low-hanging gains, but how could we look at the medium long-term? Africa is here for the long haul. It's got a 20, 2063 uh, year agenda to become a developed uh, continent. How do we all walk this road together? So that's very interesting for us as well. The next slide. Um, Praveen, sorry, before yeah. we move uh, forward, the question yeah. came through was, will the EPA agreement not undermine the African free continental uh, trade deal? I think they, uh, they complement each other. Uh, for me, the way I unpack it is A, for the Africa trade deal to function, there's huge investments. Right now, Africa requires more than a hundred, uh, more than a hundred billion dollars worth of uh, investment needs. It requires that investment. It requires renewable energy. It requires power. It requires knowledge, skills transfer. I think there's huge potential there. Then, once when the markets began, once when the consumer market becomes stronger, then there's an urge for brands. Uh, there's an urge for better products, uh, more qualitative products. Uh, so it's going to be a dynamic relationship between serving on one hand 
the bottom of the pyramid value chain, um, which is largely made up of, South, of, of Africa, because we, we have poverty of an extensive uh, widespread across the continent. On the other hand, we have a developed continent uh, that could uh, lend uh, its uh, support in many ways. It could invest in many ways. It could trade in, in, in many ways. So I see the EPA complementary to the Africa free trade. The Africa free trade represents intra-Africa trade needs to shift from 16, 18% to over 50, 60%. That would literally mean countries in Africa would become more prosperous, mean that the disposable income to each consumer increases substantially, which means they can enjoy holidays in Europe. They could invest in luxury goods across Europe. We could begin to develop the tourism sector. I may have not touched on the tourism sector, but let me just be very clear about this. Africa is a lucky continent. It's enriched with unprecedented value in terms of natural beauty, flora and fauna. How do we translate that into a product. For example, the giraffe is not an animal to a business owner. It's a product that needs to be nurtured, saved and protected. We need to educate Africa that our wildlife is not to be eaten, but to be admired, protected, so that tourists can come to us. How do we unlock that value chain? Europe has already developed a fabulous um, infrastructure for tourism for qualitative products, brands, and services. How do we bring those brands, products, and services? How do we manufacture as well in Africa? How do we enhance the consumer value and transform them into um, consuming goods of, uh, of a higher value? So for me, I see the, the uh, agreements uh, that Europe is trying up with Africa and the free trade agreement as being complementary and supporting each other's growth. I think it's, it's an advantage to have both those agreements in place. How do we fit harmoniously um, in terms of the needs of the continent? I think those should be unpacked. I think the, 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 through the Chamber of Commerce and through business houses, through the university structures, et cetera, should be case studies emerging there um, to, to unpack those opportunities. So I think the coming together of business, industry, government, uh, and of course, uh, education and training, uh, that will definitely uh, be major spin-offs for the continent. Okay. Thank you so much, Kavin. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? So I just let me go ahead. Please go ahead. Slide. Good, great. If there's a next slide for me. Uh, yeah, the, we, we spoke about the digital economy. Now, another spin-off from COVID, whilst we are looking at all the challenges of COVID, it has reset the human mind and made the world suddenly look at new ways of doing business. Right now, we're having this conversation and, and it's translating to uh, every other area, uh, every other embassy, uh, st stakeholders are involved with it. Um, we're literally crashing borders uh, and, and converging an Africa Euro European digital strategy. I think our geographical location making us neighbors, uh, looking at uh, uh, the EU having a well uh, developed uh, digital strategy and a digital economy, how could we share through the partnership model best practices? How could we enhance uh, uh, new ways of doing businesses through the NGO systems? How could we look at new ways of uh, uh, servicing those who cannot uh, be serviced through traditional business banking uh, mediums? How could we identify um, solutions that will take services to areas that have low infrastructure development? Can we jump that uh, infrastructure need and begin to be very focused as to where the development nodes across the continent should be. Um, who should be driving this? Should be partnership models emerging um, uh, in this digital economy? We have a population in Africa, which is largely the youth. 
uh, I think the average age is 21. And they all digitally savvy. They've been to the University of FIFA. They play games. They know how to use their finger, mind, and brain coordination in, uh, far better than the generation that I am in right now. Um, so how do we extract value from uh, mobile technology? How do we translate what is an instrument, a tool, when you converge um, through the fourth industrial revolution, when digital devices begin to talk to each other and we draw uh, deep, big data, how do you infer new meanings? Uh, how do we define the needs of uh, uh, 54 countries across the continent? How do we do that? We can do that through a digital strategy by rolling out services through a mobile technology, through uh, the desktop, the first computer age was about the desktop. It was about uh, the tablet computer. It was about, um, now it's about every other device. It's every um, electronic instrument could now be uh, fed with computing power. So how do we integrate that? How do you integrate human knowledge with uh, artificial intelligent knowledge? How do we bring about new ways of understanding human behavior, human consumer behavior? Where does it exist? Through the, through the digital economy, we will be able to measure consumer behavior in real time, determine where the needs are and meet those needs. We can converge Europe with Africa in a one integrated uh, ecosystem for economic prosperity for all. Um, so how do we unpack that? How do we create the new brigade of entrepreneurs, the new startups? Um, the company that I represent, uh, that's spearheaded by Sharad Maraj, a 26-year-old, um, is trying to is is one of those initiatives uh, of Trade Bricks is to uh, drive such an initiative across the continent and then handshake with the uh, with Europe. So for me. Uh, investments in the digital economy is critical. Telecommunications infrastructure is, is critical. If you can't put the solid uh, old world infrastructure in place, how do we put the digital infrastructure in place? We now know there's 20, uh, up to 20 um, data centers that are being set up in Africa. So it reduces the latency between uh, Africa and other countries in the world. So literally, we'll have real-time conversation, real-time productivity. We can share the manufacturing spread across Europe. We can share our strengths. If you find certain material here in Africa and we have the best practice and the machinery to produce it in Africa, in, in Europe, how do we tie that up through the fourth industrial revolution using uh, latest technology, telecommunication, so that manufacturing could unfold uh, between partners? So for me, the concept of partnership between the EU and uh, Africa takes on that kind of significant meaning. It has to be deep, profound, and translate into such initiatives. And I think through the Chamber of Commerce uh, across the continent, uh, we must be able to walk that agenda uh, going into the future. So bring the uh, Free Trade Africa Agreement, bring the EPA together, put the digital strategy together. How do we handshake partnerships across Europe, across Africa? Next slide, please. So uh, the EU has got a, a strategy in place. It's a wonderful document. I think it's a 2020 latest release. Uh, it makes very interesting reading. So it just talks, the talking points are about what I'm just talking about. Um, Janka, president uh, of, um, of the free trade of, of the EU, uh, uh, the U European Commission, uh, look at that, talks about this new alliance. How do we unlock it? How do we unpack it? Let's take that partnership to the next level. And I think there's a guiding document that provides us uh, this uh, opportunity, a roadmap to unlock that, that road. The next slide. So, yep, so here we are sitting on a substantial, just to sum up, beginning to sum up, sum up right now. Um, 
these are some of the opportunities for us. We've got a youthful population. We've got a um, Africa that's ripe for development. We have the natural resources. We have uh, the infrastructure, the geography of a well location well-located infrastructure for manufacturing, et cetera. I think using uh, the spread of uh, mobile cellular tele technology subscription, have a look at the statistics, it's increasing exponentially. How do we take that mobile solution uh, and translate it from social usage to meaningful business relationships? How can we level the playing field between those who do not have and those who have? How do we bring the poor in alignment with those who are well equipped and well resourced? I think the technology exists today for that handshake. The next slide. Great stuff. So here we are, the digital economy, and, and we've spoken a lot about that and how do we create that common market uh, between Africa, between the EU. For me, there's a lot of talking points there. We need to unpack that in the unfolding months. We need to unpack that. We need to make that very operational uh, across the continent of Africa. So our task at the Chamber of Commerce, at Trade Breaks, at other uh, places of uh, wherever decisions are taken, uh, we'll have to bring this to uh, fruition through active discussion. The next slide. Great stuff. Okay, the next one. So all what we've spoken about in a nutshell, human-centered, digital by default, build on existing institutional threat, internet access. These are some statistics on internet. So just to give you an idea that Africa is not really a dark continent, it's uh, well and truly wide up with the world. How do we translate that into economic activity? Next slide. Data centers, we've spoken about that. There's about 20 data centers that are coming through, reduces latency. So all businesses, trading houses across Europe, um, the message to very clearly, our target audience will also be the hundred trillion dollars that sits uh, with uh, pension funds and other uh, venture funds, etc. How do we bring the private sector into Africa? This is a compelling argument to the EU that if you can extract greater value, rand for rand, euro for euro, in Africa, then Africa is, has got the infrastructure, wherever it may be, let's build from there and then bring that vision of prosperous Africa together. Next slide. Next slide, we understand that, so we won't go there. Then that. This is some idea of pricing, finance, infrastructure needs. This is where a lot of, for us, financing the infrastructure needs, tapping into the $100 trillion uh, that sits with the private sector across the world, uh, selling the dream that uh, Africa has arrived, it's a reality, it's a safe investment uh, continent. Um, who is there to um, um, vouch for that? If you look at all the laws, the new policies, procedures that are emerging, if you look at the investments from uh, different quarters of uh, different parts of the world in the last uh, 10, 12, last two decades, uh, then you'll see that Africa is the most exciting uh, destination. It is the last big market. Africa is uh, the largest trading block through the free trade agreement, larger than even the World Trade Organization. So you begin to actually see that, then be able to unlock the, uh, the opportunity in Africa. The next slide. For me, for me, this is a very important segment. Now, Africa is, is ripe for a frugal econ econ economy model. 
We want to do more with less. And how can we take traditional development models and overhaul them to serve 1.2 billion Africans? The frugal economic model is an ideal for the continent. This addresses both the top and the bottom of the consumer pyramid. When we are at this start, this embryonic stage of this renaissance in Africa, then here's a model to adopt that will ensure that the bottom of the pyramid consumers are not are also part of the solution as we serve the more middle class and upper middle class. What the lower consumer market requires is not inferior products. They're looking for qualitative products, but they're looking for value oriented products. It's not about producing more from less, but it's producing better from less. And companies that are achieving embedding frug frugality within their business models are like Pepsi, Ford, Siemens, Unilever. If you give, let's look at an example in, in Europe, Volkswagen. Uh, at one time, one assembly line produced one model. Now the they're producing different models of one assembly line. So they're creating greater value using one assembly line, but bringing in different models. So Africa requires a lot of, requires frugal innovation. It requires new ways of looking at uh, investments on the continent. First rate, affordable and sustainable products and services requires less time, less capital, less energy. How could we bring that together? For me, you've got the free trade Africa, the EPA on one hand, and you've got frugal innovation on the other hand. If you bring them together, then you've got 1.2 billion brand new market. And it's ripe for those red markets to become blue ocean markets. So for me, that's what the blue ocean is all about, is how do you take frugal innovation, bring about embedding that within your existing uh, business models, bringing greater value, using less, less capital, less energy. Africa is energy deficient. It requires more power. It requires electricity. How do you bring products, brands, and services using less energy, using renewable energy, how do we drive all of that? I think those are big takeaways for me. Next point. All right, so once again, this is more or less my end and I'm very grateful to the Belgian Chamber, the Swiss Chamber, the French, South African Chamber of Commerce, Spanish Chamber, Manola for putting this together. So we can go into a question and answer session right now. Thank you. Avin, thank you so very much. I think this has now given everybody a chance to look at their current, if not all of you, but uh, your strategy from a red ocean strategy to shift yes. it into blue ocean strategy with an available market of 1.2 million available yes. to you to grow your business. Ladies and gentlemen, are there any questions uh, that you'd like to either pose on the chat or put your hands up and then ask Praveen directly, please. I see that nothing is coming through. Um, right. Oh, here we go. Um, let's see. I've got... No, I don't see any other question coming through. No um, I see that Clive... Um, Ask the question, Praveen, and you probably did um, address it to some extent. But before we sign off, um, mm. a comment that uh, Clive uh, Viveros, uh, if I haven't pronounced it correctly, apologies, Clive. Are there different approaches to public and private sectors in the different in the different African countries when they do business? 
Are there different approaches that you can recommend to them whilst they start developing their new blue ocean strategy to grow their business uh, into Africa and obviously capitalize on the African free trade deal? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Africa has a very differentiated uh, economic scenario right now. So you may have a very well-developed rules-based uh, uh, country. On the other hand, you would have uh, uh, a country that may not be rules-based. It, uh, uh, it may not want you to take out your investments from the country. Uh, I think all of that is being unpacked right now in terms of how uh, Africa harmonizes a more common orientated economic agenda. From my reading of the, uh, the unfolding negotiations at the free trade agreement, looking at, um, uh, for example, the special economic zones and the benefits of the special economic zones. So one way of uh, uh, addressing uh, a, a country that has, has laws that inhibit foreign investment would be the special economic zones, for example. Now, the special economic zone favors investors. They're better trading deals. They're better uh, ways of uh, taking out the funds from a country, uh, investing in that country. So, and I think there's over a thousand plus uh, SEZs across the uh, continent. So there, there's a huge number of investor destinations across the continent. South Africa has uh, special economic zones. Um, King, uh, the, at, at the airport, uh, the auto industry, you name it, uh, in, uh, in the Eastern Cape, there's I think seven or eight uh, special economic zones where the laws favor foreign investments. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that's how governments across Africa have been addressing um, laws that were deemed to be, uh, you know, uh, preventing investments into the continent. So yeah, there are innovative ways, and I'm sure those are dynamic, they're unfolding, uh, but at the end of the day, the, the agenda for uh, private sector is very clear. Uh, foreign investments, uh, there's a level of pragmatism across the continent. That's what has brought the free trade agreement together. I mentioned that for, for pragmatism to, to prevail, ideologies would have to lose its hue. It has to, right? So, so you now got a very real opportunity to invest in the continent, across the continent. And uh, uh, some continents will have more favorable trading uh, agreements and laws uh, and best practices because they're a bit more mature um, whilst others are emerging. But I think we need to find the happy medium that serves the people of a country at the same time serves investors. And that's what a stakeholder model is all about. And if there's compelling argument that's not favoring investors, then there must be lobby. And Africa is about negotiations. Partners talk things through. That's what the EU has done. They've shifted the model to be one of equals amongst partners. For me, that's a big takeaway. That's a very grand negotiating platform to negotiate deals that will benefit. If you have an alternative point that will bring greater value to a village, to a continent, to a town, to a city, then bring that to the fore. But there's no, there's no like we imposing a set of values upon you and take it and go. If you can show that there's value for both parties in this partnership model, then that's what we take away, you see? But make no mistake that the public sector has a developmental goal and the private sector has a trade and investment goal. And we need to find that happy medium that you need to adopt trade and investment for the objective of development. And if you look at the latest documents in the EPA, it talks to precisely that agenda. Developments through trade and investment. 
which means public-private partnership in a handshake that benefits society on one hand, that's the public sector, and the private sector on the other hand. So yes, there are rules that affects the public sector, that affects the private sector. But in my view, these laws are meant to favor trade and investments, but with the objective of development. If you achieve that agenda, then Africa becomes prosperous. It becomes a powerful consuming market. Who benefits? The luxury manufacturers across Europe will benefit substantially. So Wonderful. that's where the opportunity privileges lie. Thank you so Thank much, Prabhu. Um, I, <laughs> I see that okay. there is one other message that has just come through. Um, yes. And um, what I do want to say is, as I close this, because we're not getting too many, Leandri Ferry made a very good comment here, which I'd like to read to everyone in case you haven't seen it, is that the free trade agreement is coming to place so that we can show more transparency on the African scene so as to shed off the label of Africa being a corrupt continent with policies and like governance coming on. So if implemented well, Africa should be a very different economy from the previous one. Uh, Leandri, that is very, very powerful. Thank you for that. And I see that you've just um, made another comment here where you say, how do you solve the problem of lack of economic information on Africa? And there is no one in place with such information. Well, there is a number of, of uh, organizations available to, to give you this kind of information. And I invite all of you to get hold of uh, Trade Bricks who can empower you uh, in putting your blue ocean strategy to uh, benefit uh, with the markets into Africa. And obviously there's a number of universities around South Africa, the big major universities um, and the, uh, the schools of economic and management sciences who can also give you some information on this. And Leandri, thank you so much for this. Praveen, thank you for today. Thank you for Pleasure. empowering us with all of this. And I thank all of you as well for joining us today. And if there's no further questions, we will send you this presentation and the recording. And we invite you to connect to, um, to Trade Bricks and you can get hold of us and we'll uh, connect you with them. And we thank you so much for attending. Keep well thank and you. stay safe. Thank Manola, you, everybody. Thank you, very much. thank you, dear all, for attending this session. And it was a pleasure serving you today. Thank Lovely. You. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Yes. Bye. Bye.